back of the horse, they swept across the plains. At a river called the Little Bighorn, under a warrior called Crazy Horse, they humbled a nation and won the greatest victory in the wars for the West. On a spring morning in 1870, a Sioux warrior speaks of the wolf that stalks his sleep. A good sign for a raid. have spotted a herd of ponies one day's walk from the village. They belong to a war party of their bitter enemy, the Crow. On the wide open plains, power rides with the horse and the tribe that owns the most. In battle, this small band is no match for a Crow war party. Today, their weapons will not be axe or arrow, but the buffalo hide rope and stealth. The warrior Curly Hair is armed with just a stick a record of courage marked by hawk's feathers and strips of ermine. This day he hopes to capture more than horses. He is after glory. Crow are caught off guard, and Curly Hair seizes the best horse. Suddenly, he turns back for a greater prize. By touching an armed enemy with his coup stick, he will disgrace the Crow and honor himself if he survives. He has risked death and humbled his foe. Today on his coup stick, he will add one more honor. About 30 years earlier, the youngest Sioux warrior came into his tribe. Like every child, he was given a sacred pouch to protect him inside a piece of his umbilical cord. In boyhood, his hair would grow light and wavy, and he would gain the name Curly Hair. Not till he proved his bravery would he earn his father's name, Tashunka Witko, Crazy Horse. The tribe of Curly Hair was called the Lakota, one of three large tribes that made up the great nation of the Sioux. Nearly 200 years earlier, stronger tribes forced the Sioux from the lands they farmed near the Great Lakes. With only dogs as pack animals, the Sioux moved west, toward the flat land where great horned beasts were fabled to roam. When they reached these great plains, the Sioux found that the fables were true. The trail of the buffalo became the way of the Sioux. 
For most of the year, in bands a few hundred strong, they followed the herds. Their way of life now depended on the buffalo and that other great animal of the plains, the horse. Astride the animal's bare back, a Sioux warrior could hunt farther and faster than ever. At an early age, Curly Hair learned to shoot with iron-tipped arrows. Everything else was trial and error. survival depended on the warrior's skill with the bow. Silent and quick and deadly at a hundred yards. Every scrap of the buffalo was used for drinking horns, for shields and teepees, for saddles on long journeys. The hooves became toys to teach children the ways of hunting and fighting. The hides were dried for robes, scraped for rawhide, tanned for shirts and moccasins. No war party would set out without several pair for each man. A time of making moccasins meant a time for war. The sinews of the buffalo stitched their moccasins and strung their bows. The bows brought down the buffalo. The cycle began anew. No creature was so revered as the buffalo. After it was killed, it was celebrated. From the buffalo, from the earth, warriors drew strength. In visions of an animal, wolf, crow, bear, they sought guidance. In dreams of nature, snow, thunder, lightning, they found inspiration. In the world of visions, wolves spoke, thunder sang, and horses rode on clouds. Thirteenth year, Curly Hair was sent off alone to seek his vision, his own guidance on the path of a warrior. staring into the clouds and the stars. Sharp stones kept him awake. After three dreamless days, he felt unworthy of a vision and gave up his vigil. Only then, in his weakness, did it come.
horse floated toward him. On its back rode a warrior. The man rode through a flight of arrows, but they failed to strike him. A storm engulfed him. Lightning flashed across his face, and white spots covered his body. A hawk flew past the warrior's head, and the boy awoke. Much later, his father interpreted the vision. The power of lightning and the guidance of the hawk would shield him from the weapons of his enemies. All his life, he would fight protected by the medicine of his vision. The years pass and the power of curly hair's medicine is put to the test. A Sioux elder has died. To end their suffering, the tribe must take an enemy's soul. Now is the time of making moccasins, of going to war. Not for horses, but scalps. Like the other warriors, Curly Hair paints his face in the symbols of the spirit world, another shield in the battle ahead. To his horse, each man ties a small pouch, his wotawe, or protection. Then the warriors gather their weapons, quivers of newly made arrows, lances, some decorated with a bear's paw to invoke the beast's power. They wear their finest adornment, breastplates made of shells, bear claw necklaces. In splendid bonnets of eagle feathers, they announce their tally of coups counted and scalps taken. They hope for victory, but dress to meet death. Yet one warrior is garbed in the plainest of clothing. Wrapped in the protection of his vision, he scorns finery and death. <laughs> Leaving the village, the Sioux travel the sacred red road, the path of war. Days later, the Sioux war party reaches the land of the Arapaho. Tomorrow they will attack. Tonight they pass the war pipe, summoning a blessing from Wakantanka, the great spirit. The moment is solemn. To take a scalp is to take a soul. Only the bravest among them will try, and the bravest is curly hair. In the hills near the Arapaho camp, the Sioux stumble upon their foe. The weapon they counted on, surprise, is lost. The raid turns into a standoff. Only reckless bravery will win what they have come for. Only one is so recklessly brave, curly hair. In the scalp lives the dead man's spirit. No! 
Now it belongs to curly hair. For this boldest of dares, curly hair earns his father's name, Toshunka Witko, Crazy Horse. So esteemed is he that the tribe's warrior societies vie for his comradeship. Crazy Horse joins one of the greatest, the Crow Owners. Under their magic, his arrows would fly as swift and straight as the Crow itself. As a talisman, he carries a rawhide case containing the skin and feathers of a crow to be purified over a sagebrush fire. Crazy Horse is made a chief, then a lance bearer. With that title comes the greatest honor and the greatest challenge. To fight tethered to a lance driven into the earth. A sign that he will not retreat, however fierce the enemy. Crazy Horse now makes his stand against the worst enemy he will know. By the 1870s, a new foe had entered the land of the Sioux, with their own warriors to protect them. Sapa, the Black Hills, a place of vision sacred to the Sioux, white men found something more sacred, gold. Railroads crossed the hunting grounds Crazy Horse had ridden all his life. Wherever the iron horse passed, the buffalo fell. shot for their hides, the rest was left to run. The worst threat came in the wagons. They brought an alien notion that land could be owned. One voice answered for the Sioux, the voice of Crazy Horse. One does not sell the earth upon which the people walk. In the summer of 1876, Crazy Horse and the great chief Sitting Bull led an army of warriors to the Valley of the Greasy Grass. Beside the river, the whites call the Little Bighorn. On the afternoon of June 25th, scouts from the Sioux's old enemy, the Crow, guide 264 blue coats toward the Little Bighorn under the long hair colonel called Custer.
plains echo with the rumble of a thousand Sioux horses. This day, Crazy Horse wears his painted thunderbolt and his single hawk's feather, the protection of his boyhood vision. Since his childhood, the Sioux have taken up the white man's guns. But once more, their greatest weapon is cunning. George Armstrong Custer has brashly ridden into a trap. The Sioux would recall that the battle did not last long enough to light a pipe. Not one of Custer's men was left alive. Crazy Horse had known no victory like it. He would not know another. Within a year, Crazy Horse's world collapses around him. In a feud over a woman, he is shot in the face. Disgraced, he loses the right to wear the hair-fringed shirt of a tribal leader. His brother is shot dead by miners. His newborn daughter dies from a strange new disease, cholera. By winter, his people are weakened by hunger and exhausted by fighting. On September 4, 1877, a year after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Crazy Horse walks through the gate of Fort Robinson, Nebraska. He is ready to lead his band onto the reservation. Instead, he is led into the guardhouse. A little after six, Crazy Horse fights his last battle. stabbed in the back with a bayonet and bleeds to death. He is 36 years old. Much time would pass before white men would recall, with honor, the horse soldiers of the plains. We are the matriarchal Tichuan Lakota Oyate of the Ocheti Shakoan an indigenous First Nation people of Turtle Island, the continent known as North America. In togetherness with our buffalo relatives, the Tatanka Oyate, we once roamed freely across the vast prairies and hills of the Northern Great Plains until the occupation of these lands by the expanding United States Empire. Born over thousands of years, our sacred way of life taught us to live, love, and thrive qualities that endure in our survival today. As we move beyond seven generations in our unyielding struggle to resist genocide, our matriarchal grandmothers are taking back their strength once again. In togetherness with Lakota warriors and people, we speak out for accountability and change to end the atrocities that keep us from healing our nation. Only by understanding our story and our people live free once again. To our relatives from the four directions, we ask you to listen, not only with your ears, but with your hearts. From the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the place you know as South Dakota, this is our story.
We did not ask you white men to come here. We do not want your civilization. We would live as our fathers did and their fathers before them. In 1492, the indigenous Arawak people of the Caribbean islands encountered Christopher Columbus of Spain. Columbus wrote in his log, they would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Columbus proceeded to unleash a reign of terror unlike anything seen before. When he was finished, eight million Arawaks, virtually the entire native population of Hispanolia, had been exterminated by torture, murder, forced labor, starvation, disease, and despair. Columbus's atrocities with cross and sword were justified by the Christian doctrine of divine discovery and set religious and legal precedent for the invasion and genocide of America's indigenous peoples for the next 500 years and beyond. By 1650, a precarious relationship between the First Nations of the East Coast of North America and New England colonists was collapsing into slaughter and enslavement of native people by settlers who wanted more land and wealth. We find that most of the English colonies sanctioned and encouraged scalping Indians. In 1776, the United States birthed the first 13 states on land taken through the ethnic cleansing of dozens of eastern seaboard tribes. The Declaration of Independence further enshrined the belief of Euro-American settler supremacy by declaring native peoples to be merciless Indian savages. In 1787, the United States adopted its constitution. Article 6 established treaties as the supreme law of the land. Despite this supreme law, treaties with sovereign native nations became slippery promises, easily broken when convenient. In 1823, in the case of Johnson and Graham Lessee v. McIntosh, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the First Nation people's right of occupancy was subordinate to the United States' divine right of discovery. The United States has unequivocally agreed that discovery gave an exclusive right to extinguish the Indian title of occupancy. This landmark ruling provided legal cover for governmental policies that would claim white Euro-Christian supremacy as justification for stealing indigenous lands and for the genocide of native peoples. In 1849, the California Gold Rush triggered the mass Western migration of settlers, putting them in direct conflict with existing indigenous nations. In 1851, anxious to protect white settlers on their way to California and to avoid a full-scale war with the Lakota and our allies, the United States requested the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the Sioux and other Northern Great Plains nations. Six Sioux men signed the treaty, which recognized the Lakota nation's sovereignty over a vast territory amounting to approximately 5% of the continental United States. With the end of the Civil War in 1865, the United States sent its war-hardened soldiers on a crusade to settle the West. Led by the growing dogma of manifest destiny, the U.S. claimed the God-given right to expand its borders from sea to shiny sea. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill them. In 1868, unable to defeat the warriors of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations fighting to protect our lands and people, for the first time in its history, the United States appealed for peace and drafted the second Treaty of Fort Laramie. The treaty established the Great Sioux Reservation, including the Black Hills and unceded Indian Territory, to be set apart for the absolute and undisturbed use and occupation of the Indians, and that no white person or persons shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy any portion of the Indian Territory. Unable to defeat our free Lakota people with military might, the U.S. government increased the use of deceptive practices to subvert our matriarchal system and to create the appearance of agreement when our lands and rights were stolen. It is my purpose to utterly exterminate the Sioux. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromise can be made. 
just three years later in 1871, the U.S. government ceased to recognize Indian nations as sovereign and independent with the passage of the Indian Appropriation Act. This legislation legalized the theft of our treaty-protected lands and further threatened our way of life with our buffalo relatives. The civilization of the Indians is impossible while the buffalo remained upon the plains. The mass slaughter of our buffalo relatives, the Tatanko Oyate, lasted from 1871 until 1910. In just the first seven years, buffalo hunters decimated the great herds of buffalo nearly to extinction. The U.S. Army encouraged the slaughter by providing free ammunition and supplies. In 1873 alone, buffalo hunters massacred more than 1.5 million buffalo. As planned, our people became increasingly dependent on the U.S. government for even the most basic of human needs, like food, clothing, and shelter. In 1874, after illegally trespassing on Lakota territory, General George Custer publicly announced the discovery of gold in the Pahasapa, the Black Hills. As intended, the announcement unleashed a flood of miners and prospectors into the Great Sioux Reservation in violation of the 1868 treaty. In 1875, the U.S. demanded we sell the entire Black Hills region. We refused. The U.S. declared this an act of war and launched a massive invasion of our lands to annihilate our people. Nothing short of their annihilation will get the Black Hills from them. On the 25th of June, 1876, in the Battle of the Greasy Grass, or Little Bighorn, the Sioux Nation, along with our Cheyenne and Arapaho relatives, won a great victory over General Custer and the elite 7th Cavalry. On that day, we defeated the might of the U.S. Army and took their flag. Seeking revenge for their defeat, the U.S. Army directed Colonel Randall McKenzie to unleash total war. U.S. forces went from village to village, killing women, children, and ponies, and destroying teepees, clothing, blankets, and food supplies. The U.S. then launched a sell or starve policy and withheld rations to coerce our people to sell the Black Hills and to relinquish our sovereign rights. These inhuman atrocities forced the surrender of many Lakota people to the U.S. agencies by spring of 1877. Despite being on the brink of starvation, few of our people signed the agreement to cede the Black Hills. When the paper was signed by Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and others to give up the Black Hills, the majority of the Indians of the Teton Sioux tribe were not there and they never consented to giving up the Black Hills and never gave those chiefs permission or authority to sell or give up the Black Hills. Unable to obtain the required three-fourths consent, the U.S. seized the Black Hills with an act of Congress in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. Incensed by the illegal seizure, negotiator for the U.S. Henry Benjamin Whipple wrote, I know of no other instance in history where a great nation has so shamefully violated its oath. Our country must forever bear the disgrace and suffer the retribution of its wrongdoings. Our children's children will tell the sad story in hushed tones and wonder how their fathers dared so to trample on justice and trifle with God. After breaking treaties, seizing native lands, and destroying our system of life, the U.S. government introduced another element of the genocide of Turtle Island's indigenous people, assimilation. Kill the Indian, save the man. In the 1880s, the U.S. government joined forces with Christian and Catholic missionaries to steal native children as young as two years old from their families ship them to schools far away, burn their clothes, and cut their hair, deprive them of loving family contact for years, and use mental and physical abuse to force their assimilation into American society and the Christian religion. There are but two goals for the Indians, civilization or annihilation. 
In 1883, the U.S. created the Code of Indian Offenses to criminalize our culture and spiritual practices such as the sun dance, the giveaway, gifts for the bride, feasts, and medicine men. Punishments included fines, hard labor, imprisonment, and withheld rations. In 1885, the U.S. Congress continued its assault on tribal sovereignty by passing the Major Crimes Act, which unilaterally extended U.S. jurisdiction over major crimes into sovereign Lakota territory. In 1887, the U.S. Congress approved the General Allotment Act to divide communal land of the Great Sioux Reservation into individual parcels of privately owned property assigned to tribal members. Our people had no concept of individual ownership of our Mother Earth. The Indian must be imbued with the exalting egotism of American civilization so that he will say, I, instead of we, and this is mine instead of this is ours. Two years later in 1889, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, the U.S. Congress passed an act to divide the Great Sioux Reservation into five separate and smaller reservations, including the Pine Ridge Reservation. The U.S. government opened the remaining 11 million acres of Sioux Treaty territory for public purchase, including sacred sites and burial grounds our people used for thousands of years. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, followed up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. By 1890, our Lakota people, once powerful and free, were entirely dependent on the U.S. government. The U.S. had forcibly removed our people from our homeland, confined them to reservations, cut their rations by half, stolen our children, and decimated the great herds of our buffalo relatives. On the 29th of December, 500 soldiers of the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment surrounded Bigfoot's band of about 350 Lakota people at Wounded Knee Creek, and along with four rapid-fire Gatling guns, massacred 312 of our men, women, and children. Our people know Wounded Knee as a massacre. The U.S. government calls it a battle. 23 U.S. troops were awarded the Medal of Honor. Something else died here in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dreams died here. It was a beautiful dream. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead. In 1903, the U.S. Supreme Court decision Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock secured U.S. hedge money over indigenous peoples by granting Congress unlimited authority to break Indian treaties unilaterally to sell treaty-protected land and to regulate all aspects of Indian affairs without the consent of indigenous nations. In 1934, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress passed the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA. In a misguided attempt to fix the indigenous nations the U.S. deliberately had broken. Despite opposition from traditional elders and in violation of the 1868 treaty, John Collier, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and Harold Ix, Secretary of Interior, illegally approved the IRA Oglala Sioux Tribal Council and Constitution for the Pine Ridge Reservation with the support of only 1,348 tribal members out of an estimated 12,000 Oglala Lakota people. Most of our people were ineligible, unable, or unwilling to cast a vote. In the 1960s and 70s, U.S. Indian Health Services, IHS, physicians performed involuntary sterilizations on thousands of Lakota women aged 15 to 44. 
IHS facilities singled out full-blood Lakota women for sterilization procedures. On the 27th of February, 1973, 300 American Indian movement activists from more than 75 tribes began occupying Wodini, the site of the massacre 83 years earlier. Traditional elders from Pine Ridge sought to exercise our people's natural right to sovereignty and to take a stand against the corruption of the illegal Oglala Sioux tribe government. Continuing the 150-year war on the Lakota people, federal authorities escalated the occupation of Wounded Knee into armed conflict with a force of U.S. Marshals, FBI agents, National Guard personnel, armored personnel carriers mounted with machine guns, snipers and helicopters, semi and fully automatic assault rifles, grenade launchers, tear gas, jets for aerial photographs, and paramilitary personnel. The occupation ended after 71 days when a local Lakota man was killed by a federal sniper and both sides agreed to disarm. From 1973 to 1976, in the aftermath of the Wounded Knee takeover, the U.S. government backed Oglala Sioux Tribe President Dick Wilson and his guardians of our Oglala Nation paramilitary vigilante force, nicknamed Goons, inflicted the reign of terror on Pine Ridge. More than 60 grassroots activists, traditional full-blood Lakota people, and our supporters were assassinated. 300 were harassed and beaten, 562 were arrested, of which only 15 were convicted of crimes. During that time, the murder rate on the Pine Ridge Reservation soared to 170 per 100,000, the highest in the world at that time. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the 1877 seizure of the Black Hills was illegal, but did not return the land to our people, offering money instead. To this day, we refuse to accept the monetary compensation offered for the theft of sacred Bahasapa. In 2000, at a ceremony acknowledging the 175th anniversary of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Assistant Secretary of the BIA, Kevin Gover admitted. From the very beginning, the Office of Indian Affairs was an instrument by which the United States enforced its ambition against the Indian nations and the Indian people who stood in its path. It must be acknowledged that the deliberate spread of disease, the decimation of the mighty bison herds, the use of the poison alcohol to destroy mind and body, and the cowardly killing of women and children made for tragedy on a scale so ghastly that it cannot be dismissed as merely the inevitable consequence of the clash of competing ways of life. Though he described the multitude of ways the U.S. government has devastated indigenous peoples and nations, he failed to admit the truth. Genocidal warfare continues today. <laughs>